This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to another week of Living History and thank you so much for listening to previous episodes and responding to previous episodes. In particular, the episode we did last week on the Commonwealth War Graves Commission was very well received by you all out there, so thank you very much for your feedback and for tuning in to that episode. If you haven't listened to it, please go back and do so. It was quite remarkable, one of the best ones we've ever done. And going to the headquarters of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission in France and speaking to the Director General and all the people that work there about the wonderful work they do preserving cemeteries and memorials all over the world, it was really quite extraordinary. So if you haven't checked that one out, please go back and do so. And like always, if you're enjoying the content that we're producing here on Living History, please subscribe. Please subscribe through Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or one of the numerous other podcast sources where you can get this podcast from. Please subscribe, click on that review button, write a review about us, give us a star rating because the more you share it, the more you subscribe, the more you review us and get the message out there, the more people that will listen, the bigger the audience and the better content we can bring you. So thank you very much for subscribing and reviewing the podcast. Other exciting things coming up, we're about to launch the Living History website, so look out for that in a couple of weeks, and the Living History Facebook page, which will enable us to get more of this great history content to you in a more approachable way. So we're really looking forward to the website and the Facebook page coming out. And in other exciting news, if you want to walk the battlefields with me, my signature tour to Gallipoli is coming up in September 2020. It's going to be a wonderful trip. We're going to spend seven or eight days visiting the battlefields, walking the battlefields, going and seeing Gallipoli as the Anzacs saw it on tracks and paths and and places where tourists don't normally get to go. Bring your walking shoes. It's going to be really exciting. Speaking of exciting, I've got a very special announcement about it. Peter Hart, the historian that many of you would know from this podcast, is coming with us on that tour. He's going to be a special guest historian. It's one of the only times we're going to actually have two historians traveling on a tour to the battlefields. And Peter Hart knows the battlefields of Gallipoli better than anyone else. He's written several award-winning books about the campaign. He's walked that ground for hundreds and hundreds of days. I'm not sure what the uh, the collective amount of time would be that Peter has spent on the peninsula, but it's a lot, and he knows the battlefields inside and out. So I'm really looking forward to it. He and I have spent many enjoyable days walking the battlefields together of Gallipoli. Uh, and so this is wonderful to be able to do it with a, with a bunch of people who are joining us. You know, It's like showing a bunch of friends our behind-the-scenes glimpses of Gallipoli. So I'm really looking forward to that. So that's September 2020. It's already selling very fast. It's going to sell out very, very soon. So if you want to come and join us, it's an absolutely unique tour, a one-off tour. It won't be repeated at any time in the coming, in the in the near future at least. So please come with me. It's going to be great. I'm really looking forward to seeing you over there. It's going to be a wonderful experience. And speaking of Peter Hart, he is also the subject of today's podcast because this week marks the anniversary of the Battle of Passchendaele, which took place in October 1917. And this was the darkest moment of the war, of the First World War, probably for the Allies. It was just a horrific battle, the Battle of the Mud, where men fell off duckboard tracks and drowned in the mud and were mowed down by machine gun fire. An absolute disaster and and, and really one of the worst moments of the First World War for the Allies. And the architect of this battle was Sir Douglas Haig, the commander of the British Expeditionary Force, the, the, the field marshal who was in charge of all the British troops. Uh, in in France and Belgium, and, and this was seen as one of his great disasters of his entire campaign. But he's a, he's a controversial character, Douglas Hay. He's been, at some times in history, he's been lauded as the man who won the war. At other times, he's been looked at as, a, as the butcher who was responsible for millions of deaths. So Peter Hart has spent a lot of time researching Douglas Haig, and I wanted to sit down with him, particularly this week when the Battle of Passchendaele is in focus and some of those decisions made by the British High Command during the First World War are very strongly in focus. And I wanted to hear his opinion about Sir Douglas Haig and whether we have been fair to him throughout history and whether we remember him in the right way. So it was an absolutely fascinating conversation I had with Peter Hart. So please enjoy this look at Sir Douglas Haig. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Living History from a rather wet and gloomy London. But fear not, it's going to be good because I'm sitting here with Mr. Peter Hart from the Imperial War Museum. And Peter is someone who's appeared several times on the podcast, and in fact is probably one of our most popular contributors, and we're going to have another great discussion today. Pete, thanks for joining us again. 
Ah, it's great to, to be here again. I always enjoy our chats. <laughs> Last time we got together was in Gallipoli after uh, spending lots of time trekking over the battlefields. And so if you haven't listened to those ones, go back and check them out because Pete and I had some uh, fantastic uh, insights into Gallipoli after spending days and days walking the battlefields. It was a good trip, wasn't it, mate? It was, it was a fantastic trip. And I, I, you know, I, tell, I always say to everyone, if you can get out there, if you can afford it and get the time, go. It's fantastic. Yeah, I don't argue with you there. It's it's absolutely brilliant. And I've got my signature tour coming up next year to Gallipoli. So, And Mr. Peter Hart will be joining me on that tour. So if you want to come to Gallipoli, great opportunity to come along with Pete and I and walk the battlefield. Not talking about Gallipoli today. We are talking about the First World War, but focusing on the broader picture. We're going to talk about a topic which I'm sure will be controversial and raise uh, a, a bit of feedback like it always does. We're going to talk about Haig, the commander of the British forces. A man who whose reputation has gone through ups and downs over the years, but we're gonna we're gonna dig into that. Um, I think I want to start, Pete. I'm gonna I'm gonna present what is, from my perspective, a common assessment of Haig. I'm not saying this is what I think. This is just what I've heard a lot of the time. How can I sum it up? Haig was a butcher, butcher Haig, uh, which therefore suggests he did not care at all about the lives of his men. In fact. I think there's a perception that through either uh, incompetence or malice, he went out of his way to get as many of his men killed as possible, uh, particularly Australians. He had a fondness for marching Australians into machine gun fire, and he was a complete bungler. John Laffin wrote a book called Butchers and Bunglers of World War One that he featured pretty prominently in, and he was incompetent and got lots of men unnecessarily killed. Is that your perception of Douglas Haig? It, it's not my perception at all. And it, it's not really the perception of many working historians uh, on the Great War these days. Things have uh, not, in a sense, moved on. They've just gone back to the, the view that was held after the war by the people who knew, by the generals, the officers and the men who served under him. And the, it's, it's, it's not revisionism in a way. It's, it's just going back to what was thought at the time. Uh, and... and I've I've spent a lifetime looking at Haig. Uh, I'm not the only one. There's been lots of people, Gary Sheffield, Gordon Corrigan. The list is endless. And we all look at Haig. And I remember giving a talk on Haig when I was 16, the first talk I ever gave. I think it went on for an hour and a half because I couldn't. It was meant to be 20 minutes. And, and I couldn't pronounce core. So I pronounce it corpse, <laughs> which is a bit unfortunate. <laughs> something, the subject. something fitting in, uh, <laughs> yeah. in yes, that I, I, misnaming. Yes, I'm, I'm aware of the... Uh, but but it's been a lifelong interest. And I'm a member of the Douglas Haig Fellowship, which is a group of historians and like-minded people who are who are determined to try and restore, not not create, restore the reputation of, of uh, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig. So, so you know, the, for me, this podcast is very important. You know, it's, it's a personally... Uh, it's an issue that matters to me. Give us the... We, we haven't got an hour and a half for the explanation, but give us the two-minute ex- explanation. Just sum up for us your opinion on Haig and the job that he did during the First World War. Well, to sum it up, uh, Haig was the commander-in-chief of the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force. Uh, that meant he was in charge of five armies, Five full armies. Now, people often think they, they talk about people like Curry and Monash and, and as possible future commanders. Those people were several layers below. They commanded corps, you know, or corpses, as I used to call them. <laughs> they commanded a corps, and that's one half or two thirds or even a quarter of an army. Haig had five armies. He was in charge. He had to deal with all the basic planning. His staff were in charge of fundamentally everything, not him, but his him and his staff. Uh, he had to deal with all the uh, relationship with the government back home, which in the Second World War, somebody else would have dealt with. And he had to deal with all the relationship with his allies, the French and the Belgians, which again, uh, in the Second World War would have been delegated. There would have been a, a someone of equal rank almost dealing with this. Um, he had an appreciation of how the war had to be fought. Uh, he, he knew that they had to wear down the German army to the point where they could attain a breakthrough, uh, not necessarily an advance to Berlin, but a breakthrough. And he knew it would be painful. You are fighting the German army, which is probably not the biggest, but the best army in the world, backed up by probably the second best economy. Uh, This is, they've spent, uh, you know, the last 20 years, 30 years building up the German army. We start building our army in 1914. 
No, we had 250,000 men. Everything had to be learnt from scratch. Everything. And, and, and Haig was the man who ultimately led us to victory. And people forget this. Uh, we didn't win the war by accident. We won the war as a result of the, 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 the hard fighting put in by the British, the Australians, the Canadians, the, most of all perhaps the French, which we sometimes forget, and, and the Belgians, and of course the Americans. Let's not forget them. It's a, co a collegiate effort. It's a, the, an allied victory. And Haig was right at the centre of this, uh, pulling strings, uh, working with uh, the Supreme Commander Foch in 1918, and he did deliver with Foch victory. So how is it possible, Pete? How is it possible that we can have such disparate views, that you can say he was potentially one of the greatest commanders Britain's ever had, if not the greatest commander, and there can be a public perception that he was a complete bungler and completely incompetent and had no idea what he was doing. How is it possible we can have such a gap between Firstly, I've views? got to separate. Uh, when I say I mean commander-in-chief, so I mean... He's basically fundamentally a supreme overlord staff officer. As a general, he was competent, but not in any way to me remarkable. He was basically an organiser, and, 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 and that, that, that is very important, I think, to grasp. Um, how did this view arise? It arose... <laughs> Haig really picked his enemies. Uh, his first enemy was the German Empire, and that's a humdinger. Uh, the second one is uh, Lloyd George, and the third one is uh, Winston Churchill. Now, those two politicians are brilliant men. They... But they share one thing in common, no grip or grasp of strategy whatsoever, or tactics, but strategy is what we're really dealing with, with with those two gentlemen. And in the end, at every stage, they were proved wrong. Gallipoli, complete madness. Uh, Salonika, what a waste. You know, uh, various offensives in Palestine, what was that for? You know... The Italian campaign, well, that, that's slightly different. But they proved wrong. We weren't going to win the war in 1918, were we, according to Churchill and Lloyd George? Well, actually, we did, according to Foch and Haig. Do you see what I mean? And at every stage, they proved wrong. Haig died in 19, 20, January 1928, and then the memoirs start coming out. Uh, and both, uh, both Lloyd George and Churchill used uh, uh, a, 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 staff, a, a useless, fairly useless officer called Basil Little Hart who was their researcher, and he created this, this whole image. Uh, he was an embittered man who'd come to hate the high command, and they just created this alternative narrative. I'm sure that in both Britain and, and Australia, we're used to politicians creating a false narrative, and it is my view that the whole Hague thing is a false narrative, uh, and it comes from politicians just like they so often do. Um, it's weird. Uh, and then, of course, there's this great maudlin sentimentality about it. And here we have the strange thing in Britain. I don't know whether it's in Australia, but in Britain, you have the hard right and the hard left gathering together, you know, with, oh, what a lovely war. And, and, and then, and then uh, uh, the, you know, the... the, the, the Writers of joining, piling in, you know, conservatives, I've forgotten his name, who, who pile in. And you've got this sort of perfect storm in the early 60s of both right and left gathering to attack Haig, to attack the donkeys, lions led by donkeys. Alan Clark was the, the, the chap who, who you know, made the quote up in the sense that it wasn't applied to the British at all. And, and the perfect storm against Haig. And that has never been resolved. Uh, John Terrain started the fight back with, with it, it, uh, a great historian who wrote Haig, the Educated Soldier. That was in about 1963 4. Um, and now a lot of people have been working, but the public perception doesn't change because the media, the mass media, will not allow us to change the narrative. Do you think it's a reflection as well of just the sheer bloody awfulness of the casualties of the First World War? And I say that because. Well, I was watching Blackadder the other day and, you know, the Battle of the Somme, General Haig's latest effort to move his drinks cabinet six inches closer to Berlin. To me, I mean, they weren't creating this idea. It was reflective of how people viewed the war. Could it be, Could I know it's a complicated issue, but could part of it be that at this remove, a century or even 50 years ago down the road, that the scale of the casualties is just so mind-boggling that we as humans had to simplify it in some way? And so it made sense just to say, well... That never should have happened. It wouldn't happen today. Therefore, someone screwed up. That I, I think that's 
an excellent argument and, and one that it's difficult to refute as a human being. I mean, if you look at the Somme casualties, uh, the difficulty is it's not just the British and the Australians suffering. You know, the French had much worse casualties than us. They lost 27,000 men <clears throat> dead on the first uh, uh, on the Battle of the Frontiers. The day before, we lost 600 dead at the Battle of Mons. We're not the only ones to suffer. You know, the French had much higher casualties. The Italians suffered dreadfully. The Germans and, of course, the Russians. When the Americans came into the war, their, their rate of casualties was terrible. You know, it, it, is, it is a terrible war. But the British aren't used to it. We, we've got a navy. That's what we're interested in, the navy. We're not used to having people killed in tens of thousands. We're not used to continental warfare. And, and, and we didn't like it, and we don't like it. Uh, so, you know, in, for, for instance, in the Second World War, partly, I, I believe, informed by what happened to us in the First World War, we are quite content to let the Russians take the brunt of the work. I mean, D-Day is an amazing achievement. Uh, Arnhem, battles like this are never to be forgotten, nor the North African campaign, but the bulk of the heavy lifting was done by the Russians. The, the main German army had been defeated before we landed on D-Day, in my view. It, you know, and this has been part a response. If you fight a continental war, you will suffer murderous casualties. But they always have. Napoleonic warfare, warfare every, it, it's always murderous. Um, that doesn't mean that the people in charge are murderers or evil or the rest of it. They are actually carrying out their duty. A word that we often hear applied to World War I generals and Haig in particular, a, a phrase, is the learning curve. And what people mean by that is that there were new technologies, new tactics, new strategies to be employed in the First World War for the first time. And that all generals suffered the, the, the effects of having to catch up to the technology as it, as it sped ahead. That, that, that the way to fight a war was not keeping pace with technology and generals had to, had to learn. It was a steep learning curve. Where do you stand on that argument? Well, it's, it's very interesting because, you know, the idea that Haig was against new technology is ludicrous. And I know you know that, Matt. Um, the, um, he, if there's a, an advocate of tanks in the First World War, it's Haig. Not the tank corps. Haig ordered the thousand tanks after their, despite their less than stellar performance on the fifteenth of September during the Battle of the Somme. Uh, Haig is always behind the use of tanks, uh, machine guns. Despite the rumours to the contrary, he was for and understood. Let, it let, was, let's talk on that point specifically because there is a famous quote that gets rolled out in every book about the First World War that Haig said that the machine gun was not a weapon that we should worry about. I can't remember what, exactly what the quote was. And neither can I. But what I do know is that he went to the machine gun factory before he went out to the Sudan and knew exactly what they were. The, the reason we only had two battalions, roughly the same as the Germans, is because the government economy. Uh, and as soon as we could get more, we had more. Uh, and, of course, who, who was behind bringing in so many Lewis guns? Not Haig on his own, but Haig and his staff. Uh, Haig was always behind new weapons. Uh, look at uh, the mortars, the Stokes mortar, the hand grenades. He's, he's all for all of these things. Uh, you know, when their experiments on early mortars were going on, as early as December 1914, he's saying, why, why isn't everybody using mortars? Uh, he knows the threat of German machine guns in the Battle of Nerve Chapelle. He specifically wants German machine guns identifying and taking out before they start. He knows the threat they pose. Um, gas. And it doesn't always work for him, but he's very keen on gas. And when they eventually find a gas is a dreadful weapon, but when they find the, the correct gas delivery technique, i.e. shells and Livens projectors, it's used to deadly effect to deny areas to the enemy, you know, it, it, to the Germans. It, uh, uh, aeroplanes, wow, very keen. I've written books about that, but uh, the use of aeroplanes for artillery observation and photographic reconnaissance. Haig is right there working hand in glove with Trenchard, the father of the Royal Flying Corps. He, he's in all of these things. He's absolutely rock solid for them. The problem with the learning curve is that it's not a learning curve. People say, why is it so slow? Why did it take so long to learn? The trouble is, I want you to imagine, and I'm, uh, it's difficult for me to do this without my hands, but I want you to imagine the First World War as two big dippers running side by side. And the, the, there's a German train and, and the Allied train. Let's just say it's British, but the French have a massive import on tactics. Uh, and they're running side by side. And 
it all depends where you are relative to each other. So you invent tanks and the Germans put another few lines in or invent some way of stopping tanks. You invent pillboxes. So you, it's not a static enemy. You're not fighting a static enemy. The, the enemy is a vibrant, aggressive, learning body. And they, whatever you do, they respond. So it's like two big dippers going up and down. It's no simple learning curve. That has always been a fatuous uh, example. It's two big dippers running side by side. And where you are depends. So uh, you have uh, British heavy bombardment and Nerve Chappelle, but then the Germans bring in two lines. Loose, try gas. Germans by then have got three lines. Somme, mass bombardment. Then they've got three trench systems, of which two are fully fledged. They've developed the use of redoubts. By Passchendaele, they've got pillboxes in. Uh, you know, everything is always changing. There are responses that... It, and that is why it's not fighting... A, a static target and so many people think that the germs are just some monolithic statue that you know that doesn't move and why can't we beat them well surely we can learn but the germans do learn and remember their staff officers their generals are much more experienced than ours one of the biggest problems in the british army is that most of our uh, if you look at uh, staff officers the, the ones who passed staff college in 1914 they all went off to join their regiments to see some real fighting. But staff officers are crucial to everything, every matter of logistics, tactics, everything, organisation, they do it. If you haven't got experienced people, you are in a world of trouble. Generals, look, here's one we both know, Hunter Weston, Hunter Bunter, a fool. Everyone knows he's a fool, is he? But... Over promotion. He was a colonel in January 1914, lieutenant colonel. He's a brigadier and does quite well on the AIN in, 19, in, in, in all, uh, this, the uh, summer of 1914. He's promoted again to major general in charge of a division and does, well, I'm not sure how he does it, Glip, that's a different topic. And then a month later, he's a lieutenant general. So within a year and three or four months, he's, become, he's gone from lieutenant colonel to uh, lieutenant general. He never gets promoted again. And there's something called the Peter Principle, promoted to the level of your own incompetence. The Germans don't have this. The Germans have got people who've been through the proper training in a huge army and are at the level they should be. They don't get massive sudden promotions. Pete, let's talk about the two... Uh the two claims made against Haig that I made at the top of the the top of the interview, and I'd appreciate your responses to these. Let's look at two of them. Firstly, let's start with malicious. That Haig was malicious. That he the the reason so many people died is Haig just didn't care. If to to him, men were simply to be used as cannon fodder. It didn't matter if they had wives and families. It didn't matter if thousands of them were killed. How do you respond to that suggestion? Well, two ways of responding. One is warfare is a brutal business and all commanders at any level have to be able to send their men off to die. It is not nice and you ask any officer, any senior NCO, whatever level, in the end, your job in command is to send people off and they could and probably will get killed. Um, when, you're doing, when you're attacking the best army in the world, it's even more likely uh, you just have to close your mind off to it. Haig did not visit hospitals very often, if at all, because he didn't want his mind clouded by, 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 by the horror of what he saw. I think the real judgment of the man can be seen after the war, when he spent the rest of his life, and he didn't live that long, he, only, he died at, what, 66, 67, in 1928, as we said. Um, he spent the rest of his time working for the British, Royal British Legion, and British Legion as it was then, uh, which he insisted was a non-rank organisation. Uh, he went round, he did uh, what the old claim, very, many very good deeds, very good work for charity, you know, oh, awful phrase, but he did. You know, uh, he was very popular on veterans organisations. There's no uh, uh, there's no animosity against him that there would have been if he really was a butcher. His men, when he died, there were huge parades. We often talk about um, by, by parades. I mean, his body, the streets were lined with hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands filed past his body in, you know, uh, lying in state almost. People really did appreciate his service there was no idea at all at the time that he was a butcher or that he was malevolent or that he was maliciously or uncaring 
Of course, there were individuals who thought that. And there are individuals who don't like me and you, Matt. You know, it's impossible to imagine why. <laughs> but the point is, there are people sat listening to this thinking, I don't like those two. Well, there are there are soldiers who think, I don't like that, Haig. He's a bastard, you know? But the point is, the bulk of the men didn't think that way. And the reason they didn't think that way is because he was all right. He did care. He just had a terrible job that demanded that he, he tried to put sentiment and things be, behind him. It's it's difficult for, for us. We, 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 don't, we are not Victorian stroke Edwardian gentlemen, are we? We can't see into his mind. And I think trying to pretend to is, is, is quite dodgy. I think it's interesting on that subject that um, you touched on it before that other generals don't get tarred with the same brush that the Russian generals or Foch with the French or Pershing with the Americans um, don't get tarred with the brush in spite of the fact, even Monash with the Australians, in spite of the fact that they oversaw a lot of attacks where a lot of people went in and got killed. It only seems to stick to Haig and perhaps that's because he is the most prominent of the of the generals to be well, despised these days. But. To pick up on, that's a great point, because you mentioned Haig particularly liked, right at the start, particularly liked sending Australians to their deaths. That's not Haig. That, that's Monash going, please, please, sir, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll send the men in. Now, Monash knew his corps was brilliant, and the Anzac Corps was brilliant, but it's Monash saying, I'll do it. I'll do it. It's, you know, Haig held them back as a special reserve and as a strike force and the Canadians and some of the British best divisions and corps. But it's, you know, it's not Haig hating Australians. Let's not pretend he liked them <laughs> because of their discipline. He saw their discipline as a problem, but he didn't send them to die because of discipline. He just munged about them constantly. What about the second claim the that Haig was incompetent, that he was just crap at his job and there's a real there's an almost a, an arrogance that we talk about him with after all these years that there's almost a suggestion of anyone could have done a better job anyone at all could have done a better job he was so incompetent just you know the decisions that he made were just ludicrous how do you respond to that claim well as a, as a general i up to the stage when he was commanding first army he was perfectly competent he did well on the Ain in september 1914 he did brilliantly running the defensive battle of first eeps where he he did keep a complete grip of the situation and he prepared a perfectly coherent plan although by now he's already backing off tactics um uh, for the Battle of Neuve Chapelle in March 1915, uh, but where he really comes into his own is 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 when he becomes Commander in Chief in uh, December 1915. Now here he he's not in charge of how the British advance on the Somme. That is the job of other people. Uh, what he's in charge of then is the British Army, the five armies that make up the British Army by the end, and he sets in structure a whole. He wouldn't recognise the expression, but it's it's. What the, it's not just him, but the, he sets up a system whereby, it, and it's so competent, it's, it makes me furious when people say it's, it's not. He sets up a system of, of after battle reports, which are then collated by people with different shaped heads from me and you. The ones with the extra bit, the sort of Mekon bit, you know, <laughs> out here, out back. And, you, you know, just different shaped. And these people are really bright and they collate it together. Haig doesn't collate it together. Haig just oversees the process. And they produce uh, the SS, Stationary Service, not something else, Stationary Service series of battle things. And they are what Haig would not recognise the expression, their best practice. And you have that. And throughout the war, they're updated. And these are the things that gradually... You know, how to make a divisional attack, how to use Lewis guns in action, how to, uh, how to use aeroplanes, how to use aeroplanes and tanks. How to, and it goes through the whole gamut. And they're constantly updated. And the end of it, you get the all-arms battle. Now, this was not invented by Curry or Monash. They input into it. Of course they did. They're very, very competent lieutenant generals. <laughs> and I'm pointing out again that they're not senior command. Um and, but they did contribute. The Australians, everybody contributes. The French contribute enormously to our tactics. But the all-arms battle is a wondrous thing. And it means that an ordinary British division, like the 46th Division, North Midland Division, that uh, crossed the canal at St Quentin on uh, 
the t- uh, t- 29th of uh, September 1918. That was an ordinary British division. In fact, they hadn't been very good. But suddenly they're going forward. They've got a grip of the new all-arms tactics. And it's flexible. They haven't got tanks. So what they use, they've got their rolling barrages of artillery running ahead. They've got loads of light machine guns, the Lewis machine guns, to provide firepower. They've got hand grenades. They've got rifle grenades. They've got Stokes mortars. In other words, they've got their own augmented firepower. If a 1914 battalion of British soldiers, they can fire 15 rounds a minute, you know, if they met the 1918 battalion of conscripts, not very happy conscripts, the 1914 lot would be slaughtered by the increased firepower. And they've got all these barrages, they've got gas shells, they're advancing in little strings, sausage strings, instead of uh, stupid lines. Is it stupid to advance in lines? Everybody had done it through the whole war. Hindsight, that's what, you know, but by 1918 they'd learned that, they're advancing little things. Scouts running ahead, you know, lightly carrying not much gear, just like the Germans. They didn't invent it all. The French invented most of it. Um, and you've got this all up tanks, you know, breaking down barbed wire, taking out strong points, um, uh, um, uh, cr- crushing barbed wire, most of all. Uh, but also supply tanks, bringing up the masses of, of, uh, of, of ammunition you need. All this stuff's really advanced. You've got... It, it's just, you know, the whole all-arms battle is a great creation. And if a bit doesn't fit, if you haven't got the artillery, the tanks will do it. If you haven't got the tanks, then the artillery will do it. If you haven't got them, then the cavalry will come galloping along. That might not work too well. But uh, do you know the thing? The, the cavalry are fast-moving. They're the only fast-moving thing on the battlefield. Because whippet tanks aren't fast. You can walk faster than a whippet tank. So uh, that and Haig... Mr. Incompetent Haig was the man who oversaw this process. He did not invent it, but he oversaw it. Well, I think that's a really fascinating point, Pete, because if you look at any large organisation, whether it's a private company or anything at all, you know, look at private companies on the stock exchange, they are driven and their direction is determined and the principles of that company are so importantly determined by the man or the woman at the top that you... The, the suggestion that Haig, to me, didn't know what he was doing while looking at the evidence that the British Army was evolving and changing rapidly and to such an extent that it could now soundly defeat the German Army, to suggest that Haig not only wasn't driving that change, but in fact it was happening in spite of him. It just, it, I mean, it's ludicrous is the term that I would use. Ludicrous to suggest that the head of that army was not responsible for the changes that we know were occurring in that army is is just crazy from my point of view. For me, that's the the best analogy. Haig is like the chief executive of a very, very big public company. And he his job, is his job to be in charge of a department store in South End? No. His job is to provide direction, firm, clear direction and also to stick to it and when things happen like the German offensives you've got to maintain your direction yeah I mean obviously you respond to the emergency but you have to maintain your direction like ma- making sure that the Anzac Corps and the Canadian Corps weren't used up completely in defending against the German spring offensives you, if you want to retain some striking power you're going to have to try and keep them back a bit and that's the sort of thing he does. I, uh, you know, um, he can even do inspirational, the backs to the wall message. You know, you might not think it's inspirational. Perhaps I'm dubious about it, but it worked at the time. And when people say, oh, the, the soldiers ate it, eh? Look, they used it to wipe their bottoms with. Well, do you know, that's what soldiers do with any piece of paper that comes anywhere near them. Letters from their loved ones, backside. The order of the day from Haig, backside. Does it mean it didn't mean anything to them? Well, I don't know, but I do, you know that's what that's about. Um, it's 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 an interesting. To, you can tell I get overexcited to well, talk about this, because me, it's, it makes me mad sometimes. Well, let me put this to you: it's 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 not difficult for you as someone who's a supporter of Hague to to point out the things that he did well. Might be harder to say what were the things he didn't do well. What when in your studies of Hague, what do you look back on and say, okay? Yeah, here's what he got wrong. Well, it's two things. One, his choice of subordinates wasn't always good. Uh, Charter is his intelligence officer. And he was overly loyal to people. 
Uh, I think he should have got rid of several people. Haking, I don't think the Australians like Haking. I don't either. Uh, Hunter Weston. Uh, I'm told by uh, Simon Robbins, a very, very excellent historian, uh, that Haig kept them on because um, because they were good at training troops and they weren't really used for offensives after their uh, efforts in 1916. But that's that's one problem with Haig. Um, another problem is, I'll give you an example, he does make mistakes, and the, it, it's funny, I'm going to pick on this one because it's always used to praise Haig, but after the first day of the Somme, they have this scene where uh, Joff comes and says, uh, uh, you need to get up on that Pozier's plateau. <laughs> what well, you know, and, and Haig says, no, no, I'm going to follow success, I'm going to sweep round to the right, we'll deal with Pozier's plateau we'll, by going round it, we're going to go up to the right where we've had success. And um, this is where uh, Jack Sheldon, a great historian and a, and a good soldier too, of course, I can't pronounce it like Haig, but the Schurpunkt, the Germans had a grip of the Schurpunkt. And that's why when the 36th Division got up on the Schwaben Redoubt, they weren't there long because the Germans said, ah! <laughs> <laughs> get them off, get them off now. Haig was wrong and Joff was right. Instead of attacking to the right, we should have concentrated our efforts on taking uh, the Schwaben Redoubt, uh, the Pozier's Plateau. It's not really high, but it, that ridge is crucial. And, and, and Haig got it wrong. And uh, I actually think he says something effective, silly old Joff, the man can't read a map. Well, I don't think so. I think Haig didn't get this one right. So I'm not saying he's perfect. Funnily enough, you'll often see that used as an example of, hey, getting it right, you know, because people always say you should reinforce success. You should reinforce success, but you should also seize the main tactical objective. Because if you don't do that, then you can waste an awful lot of time fannying about, taking things that don't matter, while the Germans hold what really matters, though, the sure punct, as Jack calls it, Jack Sheldon. Um, the only point I also would make, when we did take it, uh, what, five or six months later, the Germans, you know, and, and then winter comes, and they, they retreat 20, 30 miles because uh, they can't, they, you know, they, they, they've lost, the, the credibility of their line is gone, so they fall back. Uh, and and that is a mistake by Haig. There are other mistakes. He didn't do exactly cover himself in glory at Landrasses in 1914, but he did have what well, I believe in the technology today is called a screaming shit. So <laughs> <laughs> I think we all understand what that means. If you've visited Gallipoli occasionally, you get a bit of that. But um, he wasn't very well, and uh, he panicked a bit, I think. How much he panicked is argued about, but I I don't think it matters much because nothing came of it. It wasn't a big thing. But the amount of fuss you, you see about these, these the, you know, he made a, he didn't perform at his top then, but he wasn't feeling very well. So what should be done, Pete, in your estimation? What, 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 what can be done, what should be done to restore the reputation of Haig? I'd, I'm not sure it's possible. What I would like to see and I believe should be done is that there should be a full-on... Uh, documentary, uh, and not 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 particularly a, a, a two-sided one, and we've had more than enough of the other side. I would like to see an absolute full-on. This is uh, Sir Douglas Haig. This is what he achieved. This is what he was. Uh, faults and all, mistakes and all. I don't mind that. What I mean is just not endlessly going through the usual rubbish, but just looking at what he achieved, what he was, what he did. Uh, and and I think that's the only way, uh, because I think that will create controversy. I bet you get some trouble about this, to be quite honest, about the, this conversation we're having here. There are some people who literally hate Hay. Yet, if you ask them why, it's because their great-grandfather or their great-uncle didn't like him. Who says? You know, a lot of, you know, it, it's, it's myth, most of it. How should he be remembered then? If you could wave your magic wand and change public perception and, and have him remember, remembered the way you would like him to be remembered, what would that look like? I'd like him to be remembered as Britain's greatest commander-in-chief, um, but he was the only one. That's always been my, you know, because most people only command one army, so he commanded five. Uh, but but that, So that's my joke of it. I would like him to be remembered as a supremely competent staff officer, a man who'd done a lot to create the British Army before the war. We haven't even touched on that, but he was the man who, with Haldane, formed the Territorial Army. He was the man who arranged for two Indian co uh, divisions to come across uh, in 1914. You know, a, a supremely competent staff Staff officer uh, who just who managed to combine it with a, a drive to achieve 
uh, the objectives that, that, that were set for him by the politicians in Britain because it wasn't his plan. You know, I mean, he didn't set the parameters of what he did. It was set in London. Pete, thank you. It's been, uh, it's been very insightful. As you say, I'm sure we'll get some uh, spirited feedback about this conversation, but I, I always love asking these important questions about history, and thanks for joining us to share your thoughts on it. Absolute pleasure. Cheers. Cheers.